Welcome to the Close the Loop podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Dini, and today we're going to talk about strategies of unscalable marketing. I guess I should say I'm going to be talking about it. So when we're talking about an unscalable marketing plan, unscalable marketing strategies, we're often talking about the opposite most of the time, right? We're, we're usually talking about scalable marketing strategies. And by that, we mean if we throw some more money at it, Right. If we can prove that the ad is working when we budget, I don't know, fifty dollars a day, a hundred dollars a day, what happens if we were to double that budget or triple that budget or 10x or 100x that budget by increasing the scale and the magnitude of that ad? Are we still going to see the same results? And that's what we're usually talking about when we say scalable marketing, because we want to create marketing that scales. Because that way we initially start out a campaign spending a low amount of money with lower risk, right? Investments risk. And then over time we've proven, okay, if we increase the budget, we're getting more or an increased amount, maybe a slightly diminished amount. But at the end of the day, if we can, if we can spend the most amount of money we have to get a hot, the highest ROI possible, that's what we'd like to do. I mean, just sitting on the money, we could use cash in other ways, but it may not have the same return. It may not lead to growth for the business. So today we're talking about all about growth, but how is it going to come from marketing strategies that are unscalable? Scalable marketing is generally done by a process, a repeatable process that can be done without a person getting in the way as a bottleneck. When you can flip on a switch and suddenly spend two or three times more and you haven't done anything, right? Like I just changed the budget number and all of a sudden the ad went from spending 10 a day to 100 a day. So it's scaled and I haven't had to do much other than adjust the budget. That's what we're, that's scalable. So what is this unscalableness? What, what are we talking about? So unscalable means something about it requires a person, requires manual, requires pr the process itself may have elements of it that are repeatable or that are mechanical or automated, but at the end of the day, it's still functionally moving along because it's manual. So the most a person could possibly do, right? You can think about it like, well, how many phone calls could a person possibly take in a day? Well, it might be close to like a couple hundred or something like that, maximum. There's not someone who's able to answer 10 phones at once, right? It doesn't exist. There's a natural limit there and it's pretty low when we're talking about what people can do, how people can perform. Now, there are extraordinary staff. There's extraordinary people out there, just like we have the Olympics, that can do things that no one else can do. And in some sense, they might be better than the automated process <laughs> uh, at doing and executing things. But humans are still, are, are still subject to risk, to flaws, to errors, especially with repeatable tasks. There's problems. That's why a lot of times the assembly lines at companies may start out with people, but over time, as the company grows, they may shift from someone who screws on the caps to a robot that screws on the caps because it can go all day, all the time, all night, all the time, and people can't. So unscalable is the stuff that people have to do. And let's say that there's quadrants. So there's scalable on one end and like a Punnett square. On one side, it's how scalable it is. And on the other dimension, it's how repeatable it is, okay? So a scalable and repeatable campaign is what most marketing is all about. I would say 80, 90% of marketing probably falls into marketers wanting to be able to find something that works and then crank it up so that it performs at an extraordinary level. Even when you spend more, it's making you know five or 10 exits ROI. That's usually the dream, the goal, the ideal. Now. Scalable but not repeatable it is sort of like the conundrum. <laughs> I think some people have debated whether this even exists. So it it probably does, and by that I mean it's an opportunity for um, an entrepreneur, right? So something that's scalable but not repeatable is something where maybe a tool hasn't been invented quite yet because it hasn't been able to make it repeatable, right? It hasn't been able to make it so that it can perform that that function every single time, because maybe there's a time constraint, a seasonal limit. I don't want to get too complicated in this, but basically scalable and repeatable go hand in hand. And so you want that. And then there's the unscalable side. Okay. So an unscalable and repeatable strategy is something that 
still requires a person to do, but it's something they could do over and over and over again. So like taking phone calls, that is a good example for someone sitting there and doing the same kind of activity, but it still requires a human to do it. So we're talking unscalable requires a human to do it and repeatable like the phone call. Now, unscalable and not repeatable, that would be obviously problematic. So we want to stay away from, again, you want to stay away from the non-repeatable stuff in marketing because Anything that you can't repeat, it's once and done and gone. Now, there are campaigns, there are things like that where it's like, hey, look, I only have one chance to get this right. It has to be perfect from the beginning. But generally, that's not quite marketing. That's that's more like a perfectionist. That's more like striving for a perfection. And it, it leaves no room for testing. It leaves no room for experimentation. It leaves little room for feedback and for learning. You're kind of just throwing it up in the air and hoping you get it right. So that is not really marketing. Marketing is less about taking those extreme hopeful chances and more about iterative learning over time, experimentation, testing, stuff like that. Anyone can just throw something up in the air, right? Like can flip coins. So we, in marketing, in your business, you've got to be after things that are repeatable. So this episode is all about the repeatable stuff, but still done by people. Now, why, why are unscalable marketing activities activities typically ignore. Yeah, they can't be scaled, but they tend to be costly, right? Hire someone to, you know, pick up the phone, costly. To hire someone to write letters to every client, new customer, costly. And so businesses jump in and outsource that kind of stuff, but it's still a cost. And so sometimes at the end of the day, it's like, is this worth it? So a lot of unscalable marketing activities just aren't worth it because we're generally after a pretty solid return on the stuff that we want to do in marketing. And if we get too heavy in unscalable stuff, then we may grow to a point, but then we're not able to, to grow at a scalable level. So there's got to be, I think, is my opinion, a mixture of the unscalable with the scalable strategies that you're running. So I think we should be very picky about the unscalable stuff we're doing and the activities we're doing because that is more costly. Therefore, it has to work. We need it to be repeatable because we want to see if maybe we can tune this to make it work. Very few marketing strategies work right off the right off the bat, right? That <laughs> you turn on a campaign, an ad, or anything, something you're going to learn. Okay, we've got negative keywords to add. We've got to trim down this audience. We've got to change this ad, the copy. Something's not working, and that's how it works. Every time you do it, you got to try and test something else to see if it's going to get better. The campaigns that we all run should hopefully over time be improved, you know, one bit at a time. In email, you may think, well, maybe the sending time is off. Maybe the list isn't as clean as it should be. Maybe I'm not segmenting my emails as well. Now, what does an unscalable activity feel like? This is a really good question, right? Because it it obviously it's done by a person, but generally an unscalable activity feels like, man, if I just had more hours of the day, more time in the day, then I would I would spend it doing X, Y, and Z. Well, what is X, Y, Z, right? What alternatives are there? What are you forced to do manually? And you can't just hang it up on an automated solution. Now, sometimes like business may be like, look, I'm tired of doing this. I'm just going to outsource that. That's still keeping it unscalable. It's just outsourcing that. And maybe your time is more valuable than what it costs. So it's just like an operating cost at that point. So uh, another thing is, Unscalable activities can be dialed down by performing the activity less and dialed up by performing the activity more, a person doing it more. And the repeatableness of it is that it's, it's important to really get specific here. Answering a phone call, the phone call is never going to go the same every time. We've talked about this, how different every call is after the first 30 seconds. So the first 30 seconds may be a very very um, repeated, nuanced script. But then after that, there's going to be conversational pivots and turns that take that conversation, you know, any which way. It's, it's not that the call itself is repeatable after 30 seconds. It's not because you, you're not going to say the same things. But what is repeatable, right, are there's probably not going to be more than, let's say, 10 or 15 objections to any businesses, products and services. It's probably a pretty slim list. Like, obviously, price is going to be an objection for every single service, unless you're offering free services or something. But still, there, there's still may not be a cost of price and maybe a cost of time. 
So cost or price or something is always an objection, always. So while answering that may not come at the same position in the call, may not come at the same time in every call, the question may not be asked the same way, and you may not want to answer the same way. The basics are there's an objection of cost in our business. How are we handling that? That is still repeatable. You can still rehearse that, get that down to the point where you're like, I know how to answer this, no matter how it comes at me. Now it's become a repeatable part of my unscalable answering of phone calls. So that's why it's still really important to know how this stuff is broken down. So there's lots of ways that anything can be broken down into just repeatable blocks of processes and specifically in a phone call. So how does marketing, how does the marketing strategy influence that, right? So the things that come up a lot in calls can be, if we see that through scoring, it may be an interesting pivot for marketing to be like, well, hmm, what if we answer that question in the ad? What if we put that on the landing page? What if that's one of the blurbs that's on the landing page? So that instead of having to ask that, because obviously that's on the, the caller's mind, now the marketing has positioned itself so that these callers have a better chance of having known the answer. Now, if you... <laughs> splash every ad and every marketing message with the 15 objections, you're going to have no room for anything else. There's lots of ways to influence the unscalable side because the unscalable side is going to be smaller numbers, right? If, if someone's only taking 100 calls in a day, every missing one call is 1% of the calls. Of the 100 calls, 50% turn into appointments. Missing one could mean an appointment. Missing one could then mean losing a customer. You know, that's big. That's a big deal. So if marketing can influence the calls, the callers, the quality of that coming in, especially before it hits up against an unscalable activity, then marketing is doing a huge favor to them because they're not wasting time on bad calls or things like that. Now, evergreen is a great term used for content that is scalable. So let's say you make a video, a webinar or something but it's really only going to be valuable to people for a few weeks. Think of like a sports game. Everyone wants to watch that sports game live, right? Very few people are, are going to want to hold off from seeing the big game until two weeks, three weeks later. People who watch something way after the fact that it's aired in sports is very, very low numbers. So why is that? It's because everyone wants to experience it live together. They don't want to you know, not know if they're big fans. Some people don't care about sports. <laughs> But if you are a big sports fan, generally you love watching the sports live. So Evergreen is making content designed for anyone to watch it at any time and still get a lot of value at it. Like who would want to watch something that's recorded six months ago? Well, there's certain types of content people would want to watch like that. Like TV shows, movies, people watch them decades after they originally aired because the content itself is still relevant to them. Making videos is oftentimes unscalable because it's costly and have to be edited. A lot of human editing going on there. A lot of times the first videos you make, you're like, these got to be evergreen, meaning that they're going to always deliver relevance and value, even if I use this video six months from now or a year from now. Because you may say, gosh, I don't want to be making a new video every week or every month or something like that. It's, it's costly. So in the content world, evergreen is considered the scalable side of content right? In live, one-time, real-time content, you can only consume it one time or at the time that it airs, is definitely the unscalable side. But that doesn't necessarily mean that evergreen content is the only way to drive demand or drive value for a business to drive growth. There's plenty of one-off, one-time launch only, like look at, look at sports. It's a, a huge market entirely around unscalable content. <laughs> Right. They had every camera angle possible, every, you know, they have tons of people talking about it. Everything's going on. Everything's all about the moment. And so when you think about hmm, how can my marketing content add a splash of unscalable or how can it add a splash of scalable for the scalable, think evergreen for the unscalable think, well, how can I make this so valuable and so relevant, so important for someone to watch this right when they do right now that that it's got to answer that question. Right might be something where it's like, look, I'm going to offer this Black Friday deal. This is a one-time thing for another year. You're not going to see it. It's going to go off one time for a limited period of time. You may devote a lot of resources 
to making your marketing, your ads, anything like that to capture the interest that's around that seasonal point in time where everyone's like thinking about what am I going to get for Christmas? So that's kind of how you identify the activities that are scalable and unscalable in your own business too, is is every is everything I'm doing evergreen, right? Am I just throwing a website out there and redoing it in three years? Am I just posting social media just because I'm told to? What stuff is really driving value? And you're only going to know that if you have a good feedback loop, if you have good attribution, campaign, you know, recording, monitoring, stuff like that to tell you. And if you can separate what activities are unscalable from those that are scalable, it would be probably pretty fascinating for you to see, wow, hmm. Whenever I do something like a live video or a webinar or wherever I post something that just happened today or I take a picture of the job site or, you know, a holiday party or something, that there's some good interaction there. There's some good engagement there and get people engaging and talking. And whenever I run a special offer thing, that's the only time people come in or, <laughs> you know, you, you can probably take a look and see how your unscalable and currently scalable activities are working, performing. So... And that's also kind of how you evaluate, right? How much influence they're having. When it's when there's a human part of the, the process, you do need to evaluate the cost of that as well. I mean, it, it may have greater influence, but it did cost more. So at the end of the day, you're not just you can't just measure things by their, you know, front end performance. You have to put something on the other side of the scale in terms of cost. Okay, I got all the, I got the great stuff out of it, but gosh, it cost me a lot of money. Like I went to this local event. And I put up a booth and I got to talk to a lot of people. I got four customers out of it. It was fantastic. The booth didn't cost me anything, but it did cost me like a whole day. I did have to go buy a table and I did have to print out some flyers. And if you total that up, it's like, wow, my cost per lead there was actually pretty high <laughs> or maybe it was pretty low. I don't know. Maybe it did fantastic. But events, in-person stuff, very unscalable. And it has to be, there has to be a way that you evaluate every activity in your business to see how well it's performing for you. Now, as an entrepreneur, you're just like, look, my own time and going to events or self-promotion, doing live stuff, there's a cost, but I, I have to do it because I need to get a foot in the door, right? But as the business grows, it becomes very important to start looking at hmm, how much of my stuff is unscalable the way I grew in the past to get here may not help me keep growing from here. I may need more scalable campaigns, more scalable stuff. I may need more specialized education, more people, more consulting, I mean, uh, an agency, I don't know, whatever you need to then at that point scale the business is going to be very important. The next big part of this episode that I want to talk about is something that I've done a talk on, a talk at conference on, and I spoke on this and that's intimacy. So which do you think is a more intimate, a more engaging experience? Okay. So you get to a website and a chat bot pops up and says, hi, would you like to book time or set an appointment so that we can landscape your yard? <laughs> or you get to a website and someone named Jen says, hi, I see you're looking at you know, our landscaping services. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'm here. You know, I'm actually right here if you want to talk to me. So let's take a pause here. They're both getting the same information. They're both funneling you down toward an appointment, something like that, something toward whatever you're after. Now, the bot's just going to be like, hey, look, I'm, I have one purpose, right? My purpose is to get a sale and appointment booked. And if you go through that process to the bot, it's like, yeah, I did it. I got an appointment. But it, the goal of the person may be different. Now, with the gen side, they're asking you what your problem is, what your questions are. You could type in anything you want. Jen's going to interpret it and understand what it is. The bot's not going to be able to perfectly understand what your problem is. So that's why the bot has like more guided experience. And on the gen side, the person side, you're really able to communicate what's happening, what's going on. <clears throat> the same thing happens with a phone call. Phone call, hey, if you're here for sales, press one. An IVR, right? If you're here for support, press two. Yeah, if you're here, you know, if you want to uh, talk to somebody else, press zero or reception or whatever it is. That IVR, that's think of that like the robot experience. That's the scalable side. And that is not intimate at all. That is, <laughs> it's one of those things you're like, let me just get through this as fast as I can. Um, <clears throat> it's not the most rewarding customer type experience generally. So we don't want to, obviously, if you have a conversation with someone who's rude or whatever, 
probably prefer the robot. <laughs> but when we, generally speaking, someone whose job is to answer the phones is going to be doing that because they're providing an experience for the customer who's calling that can't be matched by a robot. We wouldn't want it to work that way, right? They want the first interaction, like the first touch with that first real, real time, intimate touch with that customer to be a lot more real. And that the value of that intimacy, the closer you are to the real time being in right in front of a customer, the better. If every customer had to show up in your store, in your place of business to talk to you, a, a lot less would. <laughs> But the experience would be would be a lot more telling about how serious they are, how committed they are, how interested they are, how much how committed they are, how willing they are to to buy, to spend, to work with you. That that's a pretty big deal. That's how it used to work back in the day before phone calls and and everything. Maybe they would write letters. I don't know. Anyway, so at scale, we love phone calls. We love chatbots. We love. We love everything that helps us do all this stuff at scale because it's expensive to have a person do all this. But at the, end of the, at the end of this funnel, the business is most often, unless they're e-commerce, right, is most often positioning a person with the customer or with the potential future customer, with the potential future patient. Everything has that human interaction at the end, generally. Now, if you're on Amazon, right, you're not talking to a person ever. So they cater to that experience of, look, you can figure it out on your own. You can buy whatever you want on your own. No one's helping you. <laughs> so some products and services are that way. Like they're like, look, you're, you're, you're out in the cold by yourself. You got to figure it out. Like the, they, they will provide reviews, product descriptions. But if you buy the wrong thing, it's on you. It's like eBay. If you buy, if you, <laughs> you buy a little house thinking you bought a whole house and it arrives in your mailbox and it's just a tiny little, um, like doll version of a house and you thought you're buying a whole one for a steal for 50 bucks, you know, that's on you. Like that's kind of as a e-commerce retail buyer, that's sort of on you. Some people don't, don't like that. They don't like buying shoes online and then getting them and they don't fit or clothes. They'd much rather go in person to a place and try it on physically. Really? And the intimacy there is greater. That's a big deal. When the intimacy point happens, it's the usually the highest cost interaction, the highest cost conversation in a business is going to be at that point where a human being is talking to another person because the person on your team isn't able to talk to anyone else while they're talking to that one person. They are 100% consumed by that call. So when they get there, you want that experience to be stellar, but you also don't want to waste your <laughs> you don't want to waste that your call handler's time answering calls that are fake and not real or spammy or anything. That, that's that's frustrating. Obviously, you want them to be answering calls. You want leads to be coming in. You want business to be rolling in, and that's going to help your business grow. But at the same time, you don't want it to be terrible, horrible experiences. You don't want you know every person that calls to leave hating you because their call handler was rude or something. So that that conversation, that intimate point, is so vital to do well. A lot of what we do is all based on this concept of the intimacy of a customer is paramount in marketing. When someone sees your ad and they click to your website and then they click around, that's all happening without someone guiding them, right? If What if you can position a chat bot there to be like, hey, how are you doing? What if you can position of someone who finally decides to call, say, hi, I'm putting a face and a name and a voice to this business for the first time, that's going to leave a big impression on that caller. Just because you build it that way doesn't mean it's all going to work out that way. You have to create an operational system that feedbacks to you whether it's working or not, right? Every unscalable activity is very costly. So if you don't have a feedback system telling you how your call handling is going, how your chats are going, they're handled by people, how any human thing's going, how the feedback loop on that isn't giving you the answers you need, start there. Because that's so costly to operate in a business without having any feedback loop whatsoever. It's a big deal. So another thing to consider, when we're talking about what strategies, what unscalable strategies should we be looking at, right? What should we do? That's going to be the last pivot here. What strategy should I be running? So look at your competitors. <laughs> what unscalable marketing activities are they doing? Are they going to events? Are they putting up billboards? Are they, you know, standing around twirling signs on the corners? <laughs> are they calling out? Are they, you know, how is the process of them calling in? 
visit their website. What, what kind of stuff do you think they're doing? Are they promoting? Are they running ads? Uh, if you go to Facebook, you can look up any brand, any company on Facebook, and you can see if they're running ads. You can see what ads they're running. It's called the ad tool, ad library. So if you want to see if they're running ads on Facebook, you can go there. With Google, you can't quite see that. There are tools I'd recommend. There's a tool I recommend that I use called SpyFu. It will give you a a, a good ballpark of what ads uh, another business is running. I think you can even go for free and just see like an example of one if you want to. S P Y F U dot com SpyFu. Uh, they're a great company for that. So doing some competitive research. So things that you'd really like that, that are really good ideas to improve is what I mentioned it. Phone calls, <laughs> monitor, score record you know get alerts when you miss an opportunity like that handles the phone call that could be for sales support anything and you could consider call centers things like that to help you know offset that outsourcing uh things like partnerships are also unscalable you may have a deal where you're a business that that specializes in let's say plumbing during the day but very special kinds of plumbing like let's say old homes or something like that you may say anyone who calls in the middle of the night, you may say, oh, okay, anyone who calls for not that kind of service, you may say, wow, I'm getting a lot of people just because I'm inherently a plumber. I'm getting a lot of calls for services I don't like to offer. I don't prefer to offer. They're low margin for me. My guys are more skilled. I need these higher margin jobs. I don't want to be sending them out in the middle of the night because that's not, you know, that's not the business I am. My business runs with these margins at this way. So you may say, hmm. What if I have a partnership with another plumber who is who is specialized in the 24-7 simple plumbing? Uh, that's their margins. That's their business type. What if we partnered up and they I'll send the calls to them that are insufficient, that are not ideal for me, and they will consider sending the jobs over to me that are not great for them. Maybe there's a partnership there. Maybe there's another way you can partner with another type of business altogether where you can complete j- more jobs. Because they're doing something and you're doing something. Partnerships are unscalable. (laughs) They're repeatable, but they're unscalable because they require some agreement in place. There's still things around it. There's still a lot of checking to make sure everyone's complying and everyone's still happy and good. You're, You're still delivering value to the customer and they're happy that you may not provide the service, but you're giving them a recommendation from someone that you prefer, you trust to do perform the service, you're still helping them, which still at the end of the day, the customer's gonna be like, wow, that was great. If I ever have a, you know, an old plumbing job or a specialized job, then I know who to call or I know who to recommend. That's partnerships I mentioned before, events, webinars, things like that, live webinars, especially on the unscalable type that, that provide a lot of value. There's tons of people trying to do this, do it yourself plumbing online, right? Trying to do jobs online. And so if you make a whole channel devoted to, you know, how to do this and that in YouTube, that could be huge for people in an interesting way to get your name out there. I and mean, all it would take is, you know, someone to record what they're doing in a home and get permission by the owner, the homeowner to do so, or maybe for a discount or something. You can put those videos on your website. People might be like, okay, yeah, this guy really wants to help do it yourselfers. But obviously when things go wrong, they know who to call, right? <laughs> something like that. If you really want to tell a story, like on your website, it's the content, the messaging may be seen by a lot of people, but creating content, creating a way that you can tell your story may be an unscalable process to, to get it done. There might be a video, an interview. You may have to write some stuff in person. You, like, you may have to write it. Uh, that A compelling story, a compelling messaging is usually done by a, a person at the end of the day. Handwritten letters to clients and customers, favorite customers after big jobs, you know, thanking them for their time or anything. Or if a patient had a rough time, you may have like five letters, you know, templates you have. You may, you know, open one up, change a few things, and then, you know, send it off to that patient to say, hey, you know, you had a hard time. I hope you're doing well. For some people, I might be like, wow, I've never gotten a letter like that from my dentist before. <laughs> that could be a big deal. I don't know. Taking that time, even though it's a template, taking that time to write it or change it or update it, unscalable, right? So unscalable strategy there. If you do things in-house, generally it's going to be considered unscalable. If you're like, hmm, I'd like a social media person to help me every day, you know, post pictures, post things, get the word out. I've seen a lot of, you know, businesses do really well that way, expand their reach, especially that way. And then 
asking a customer to, to leave a review, to give you feedback on their experience, right? Very unscalable. Now, it's unscalable, especially because your end of the day, your customers, your patients, whoever's coming in, you know, your, your jobs are not at tens, thousands, hundred thousands, like degree changing overnight. You know, you're getting however many jobs or however many patients you're getting. It's fairly unscalable. But if you can, you know, not every person's going to leave a review or leave you 50 or 100 reviews. They're going to take the time to write maybe one or two and that's it. But reviews can be a big deal for a business. Other people are going to see it, trust you more. It's, it's really hard to get reviews. That's why, you know, asking for them in an unscalable way is frustratingly difficult. You can train your team, your staff, your, I don't know, <laughs> Everyone in your company, people on the phone, to be to remember to ask, and it's hard to follow. You know, and remember to ask every time, or remember the right moment to ask. After someone's upset and yelling, maybe not the best time. After someone's excited and happy, might be better. You know, I don't know. It's important to consider that unscalable marketing activities at a business have a pretty high ability to generate and influence revenue, to influence growth, just like scalable activities do. And they shouldn't be discounted. They shouldn't be tossed out just because they require a person to do. Just because they're unscalable in that way. Now, obviously, anything that's not repeatable, you're going to have a lot of chance involved there, right? Um, but if you can make something repeatable, even though it's done by a person and it's still, you know, ROI positive, look, it's worth considering keeping that or making sure it's still a part of your overall plan, your overall marketing plan. So, if you can identify unscalable marketing strategies and scalable ones you're already doing or new ones you'd like to try, maybe from the suggestions I gave you, then I think that will really set you up in a place where you're you're both running strategies, but also you've got to be considering how they're being measured and how they're being tracked, right? The feedback loop, like episode one, how that's all giving you information you need to do it better. And then once you do know, Okay, these activities, marketing, sales, otherwise, whatever it is, unscalable or scalable, this is the return I'm getting. Then you have a very good case to say, okay, I'm going to stop these or I'm going to do these, right? You, you're after growth. You've got to be after more profit. So it, it means trying things constantly, cutting things out that don't work, and pushing, putting more gas to things that, that do work until they hit a ceiling. I have never seen any marketing strategy that, that didn't hit a ceiling. And just because it's unscalable, you might think, well, this is only going to impact like 10 patients or 100 patients, right? It, if the potential is there, even if it's small, it could still be a positive thing to do. It's just got to be evaluated by someone in the business, an owner, a leader in the business who can see the whole the big picture. And then finally, the last thing I would want to mention here is the intimacy part. So. What are you doing? What is your business doing today to improve the quality of the one-to-one, human-to-human interactions your business is, is having with customers today, with patients today? How are you improving that? Because that is such an important part of any business, right? How the customer interacts, the experience of the patient, the customer, the consumer that they have with your business is really going to pave the way for the future. In a, in a way that it's okay to make mistakes in the short term, but in the long term, you have to be progressing in a customer-centric way. Your customers are going to tell you how well things are performing that you're doing today and that you have been doing in the past. They may not be the golden ticket to know what you need to do in the future, but it is going to tell you how well things are working that you've been doing. So that's, it's really critical and really key. I'd say give unscalable marketing a shot. Give it a try. C look at it measure it track it don't throw it out the window because you know there's a lot of bottlenecks like you can only do it in you know one at a time <laughs> writing a letter is one at a time but there's value there it's worth trying and I, I, i've done it i've been surprised and shocked by it i never thought i'd be an advocate of unscalable i just love the scalable side especially in i'm a you know i'm a digital marketer at heart so everything there is all about scalable but the blending is where it's all at. It's where it's all about. So I really appreciate your time. You can find me on LinkedIn. You know, comment. Let me know if you have any feedback on this episode. I'd love to hear it. And good luck with the unscalable marketing.